Good afternoon. We are very pleased today to have with us uh, Dr. Brian Alexander from the National Institute for Technology and Liberal Education. And he's here today to talk about his new book, The New Digital Storytelling, Creating Narratives with New Media. Brian, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me on here. It's good to be on DS-106. DS-106 rocks. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Brian, Brian, can you just kind of give us a, a quick summary of what this book is trying to accomplish? Uh, maybe I should say no and say read the book, but instead I'll say yes. Um, I mean, the first part of it is trying to understand the idea of digital storytelling, where it came from. Uh, the term really comes from the 1990s, so we're talking about a kind of pedagogy, a real a curriculum that helps people make digital video using personal stories. And so the first part of the book, we talk about this. And at the end, I discuss a lot of ways that people have been making digital stories. But then I want to also talk about the new stuff, the new pedagogies, the new technologies. So beyond digital video, uh, other tools for making stories from blogs to Twitter. And above all, the impact of gaming as a storytelling platform. So the book just you know, covers a whole ecosystem. It surveys the terrain, giving an example of all the different ways people are telling stories, digital tools right now and then ways to get started telling your own. Thanks, Brian. Um, I have to admit that I'm a little skeptical here. Um, as a faculty member, I'm interested in, obviously, in teaching quality liberal arts courses. Um, and digital storytelling seems, it doesn't seem very, what's the right word, uh, rigorous. Um, it seems almost like, you know, what you would do uh, creating a story for your family or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Can, can you can you explain yeah. the, the, the academic well, angle it's, here? It's, it's interesting. Uh, as a piece of background, uh, at Nightly we started taking a look at digital storytelling back in 2003, and one of the key features that we discovered was that the basic curriculum of personal autobiographical storytelling appealed to quite a few people on campuses and appalled quite a few others. People would self-identify as scientists, for example, would say, I want to do a story about facts, not about my personal exactly. relationship to yes. facts. And others would say, this is a little too touchy-feely. This is too therapy-oriented. I want something more well, rigorous or at least you know, more um, less gooey. Um, and and we, we took that to heart. And we actually redesigned uh, our workshops in 2004 and started offering ones that allowed people to tell personal stories or impersonal stories, if you will. And it's, a, it's a fun teaching exercise to show different stories and ask people where do you detect the personal level. So we would show the powers of 10. I don't know if you know this, it's a classic mm -hmm. science sure. visualization. And ask people, you know, is this the ultimate impersonal story? And then would people often like this. And then show a video created by a Wabash College chemist about a certain form of lipid formation, which is really interesting. He never appears on the screen. And yet, his voiceover is so intense. None of the content is about lipids and their interactions at the molecular level, but all the content is passionate and exciting. And every time I've shown this to non-scientists, they become enthralled and excited by it. So I, I think what happens is we're seeing a kind of spectrum of storytelling. And you can think of other examples pretty easily. Think about journalists who describe what they're doing as storytelling. And that has to be rigorous. Mm -hmm. It has to be professionally fact-checked. So when you come down to education, think as a student. If you're creating a digital story, it is a form, a way, a style of multimedia authoring, much like making a digital video or making a poster or doing a series of blog posts. And for story, think argument. You have to take multiple pieces of content, multiple media, integrate them, marshal them into a coherent, recognizable, comprehensible form. Now, that may be creative in the sense of fiction. It might not be. It will probably be creative at a formal level and at a level of inspiration, which in liberal arts we believe in very passionately. But as a teacher, as an instructor trying to assess this, we already know how to assess multimedia. We know how to look for the thread of argument. We know how to assess how a student marshals evidence to support their claims. We can assess that, and we've been doing that for years, looking at how a student makes a PowerPoint presentation or a giant poster. So storytelling is a way of doing that at a deeper level, in the student level. To create a digital story is a deep cognitive act. You have to be able to form 
a shape based on all these pieces. To do that internally is a wonderful exercise. Uh, for example, Hobart and William Smith and a few other campuses have been looking at study abroad. And with that technology, there's a classic, classic pedagogical problem, study abroad. Am I loud enough for the mic? Good. One of the problems is students go abroad, have a tremendous experience, maybe even life-changing, come back, back to campus. They've got nothing to show for it. They have nothing to show for it. And also, it's a huge amount just to cram in their brains and think through. So you say, how was your trip to Florence? Uh, it was interesting. And how to, how to bring all that together is often the task of, say, writing a paper or doing something else. So for study abroad people, again, without technology, there's been the challenge of how do you integrate that experience. Uh, Doug Riley, Hobart and William Smith, and Tom D'Agostino there started experimenting with having students learn a little bit of digital storytelling before they left, and then when they came back, after having accumulated a lot of media, you know, photos, snaps, and video, make a story when they came back. And that let them synthesize all those different experiences saying, what happened to you when you were in Paris for three months? Well, I'll tell a story about, and Doug did a story about his host mother, which was amazing. And it let him think about interacting with an urban environment that was new, about trying to learn Spanish for his personal story. And we've seen this again and again. This lets students bring together diverse heterogeneous materials into a coherent, compelling flow. And you could say, in a non-rigorous way, oh, this is very emotional. That's a problem. Well, study abroad, it has to be emotional. It is going to be emotional. Are we out of time already? I, I have. Right. I hear two things here. I so hear, let, me, let me finish. Oh, sorry. So digital storytelling, it's not dependent on a particular platform. It's not like an iMovie class mm -hmm. or whatever. That practice lets students do this and fixes the it helps them process the study abroad problem. And you can shape many other pedagogical uses based on that kind of format. Please go ahead. I hear you saying that um, at least the process of constructing these digital stories is much more structured than I may have thought. Even if the story, uh, there, there's yes. more to this than extemporaneous uh, emoting yes. here. Okay. The, the other thing that I hear you saying is, and maybe this is obvious, but but uh, s digital storytelling isn't fiction necessarily. Great. It's more narrative. Right. Uh, so uh, th the thought popped into my head that, um, that uh, a scientist could actually narrate or tell the story of an experiment that they were conducting. Great. And that would fit in this genre very well. Yes. Uh, I mean, that's not a question. That's really a statement of one which I agree. But let me respond to it. Um, I mentioned the example of journalism. Journalism should be nonfiction. I mean, that's kind of the ideal. And journalists speak of their work as storytelling. And you think in science, we do have the science popularization field. You think of the great Carl Sagan, for example, who do actual science, but they're known for their visualization and their uh, way of introducing science to non-scientists. Uh, this morning in your class, we're talking about Paul Krugman, and in many ways, his style of argument is to tell a story about people he disagrees with mostly, and where they're coming from. Uh, and he uses a lot of storytelling techniques, mm -hmm. you know, trying to build a rapport with the audience by using the first person plural quite a bit, or saying, ah, th you think this is what's going on, but here's what's really going on. And just take a step back at, at a meta level. You ask people, what is a story? Or you ask them, what is not a story. And I recommend this exercise in any situation. It always works. People always produce answers. Anybody, the shyest, most terrified of speaking introvert, will come out and say, well, stories, well, heck, I know this one story and I liked it. Or if you ask them what a bad story is, everyone has examples. And that's easy to do. And when you start developing that, one of the things you get is inevitably someone will say, bad PowerPoint presentation. Or they'll say, data without meaning. This will inevitably come up. You think, okay, then what makes that a story? What makes a good PowerPoint a story? And there's no simple answer. I mean, I think I have really the, the dark secret of what makes stories happen. That's in chapter two, by the way. But I think for a lot of people to think what makes that different, you said um, a few minutes ago a family snapshot or a um, the story that you do. Telling a story to your family members. Right, right. Here's my summer vacation. Right? Yeah. You know, um, well, I went to Australia and I ate wallaby, which I did. It was excellent. 
But if you but if you want to make a story, you have to unfold it over time. You have to have people who are recognizable as characters. It could be you. It could be historical entities who are actual. You know, or it could be people who are mythic, like Jim Groom. But it can also be objects that are recognizable, and then stretch it out over time in a way that is non-obvious. An <laughs> obvious sequence is a bad story. Well, we can disagree about this. You'll be wrong, but you can try it. Um, that might be a good segue into the, uh, the other question that I had. Um, your book talks about uh, alternate reality games. Yes. That just seems, well, can you say something about that? That, that seems too much like fun. I mean, game playing as an academic enterprise? Well, I guess we can speak to either alternate reality games in particular or games in general. Um, and um, I mean, it is true that, uh, that in academia we're often suspicious of games for uh, a series of reasons. Um, there's, uh, you know, the novel Dune by Frank Herbert. Of course. Has the litany against fear, uh, which is very powerful, actually. There's a National Lampoon parody, uh, Dune, the dessert world, you know, the planet with no orange, and they have litany against fun. And I often think that in academia we have people saying this, you know, I will not have fun. I will let fun avoid me and pass by me. I will remain without fun. But I, I think for, for academia there are a few other reasons. Games are, it's a psychological term we use to refer to a form of manipulation. You know, ah, that, I don't gonna play your game. You know, that's trying to game the system. It's a, it's a, it's a way of being unethical. Uh, it's also something that we associate with children. Oh yes, that's nice for the six, six year old. Right? But, but in academia, we have to realize a few things. I mean, one is the median age of computer gamers is in the 30s. So the average game player is, say, a young faculty member in age. Uh, we know that Zach Whalen. Game. We know that for a lot of even if you don't play a game, even if you never play computer games, our hardware and our software have changed to reflect that. If your computer has a beautiful sound card and you can Skype with it, it wasn't built that way, anticipating that you're going to need beautiful sound quality for the sound caused by the closing of a window. It's because Dell or HP assumed that you are likely, like most people, most computer users, to be playing computer games. And your interfaces have changed. If you look at a TV news screen, not for the content, please never watch TV news for content ever. Just good rule. But if you look at the display of it, not the DS. Talk about an alternate reality game. Uh, unfortunately, it's too close to reality, but I, th I think you're right. It's complex in a way. It looks like the dashboard of a game, not the dashboard of a car, which is our most commonly access, access dashboard, but the multiple string of information is the kind which you would experience playing not World of Warcraft, but playing a casual game like Bejeweled. I mean, it's really, games have already warped and changed our world. As academics, we have to just deal with that at the very least, and then realize that games are pedagogical tools. Games teach. See, you might remember as a kid, looking at a board game for the first time, and it was opaque. You didn't know what it was. I mean, I think we were five, and you first picked up a chessboard, and you're like, well, that sounds cool, but what do I do? These pieces are cool, but what do they mean? What's the horse guy, right? And you have to have someone tell you how this goes. I mean, I've been learning cribbage, and I'm realizing that, you know, it took me a while. This cribbage is complex, and I'm, I'm getting okay at it, but I was trying for a while. It takes time to process that. Not computer games. No one sits down with you and says, all right, Brian, here's how you play Empire Total War. Oh, good. The game has to teach you. And if it fails, the game dies, and a game marketplace is ruthless and competitive. It makes Wall Street look like tiddlywinks. If you don't succeed pedagogically as a game designer, your game fails. So think about this. In academia, we've been watching a parallel industry, which is now the world's second largest culture industry, bigger than movies. It is a pedagogical enterprise. It has been teaching people, millions and millions and millions of people, right now as we speak. We should learn from this. Absolutely. We should see what works. And then the students, like those two guys over there, hello, nice beard, keep it coming. If they, their learning experience has changed, much like we have to think about when we look at our students, an 18-year-old comes into the class, we think, what have they learned from TV? They've learned something, it's impacted their life, right? What have they learned from print? Gaming is part of that. And then maybe, maybe as faculty members, we can try games in the classroom. And there are plenty of cases of people doing that. But you're asking about gaming in a conversation about storytelling reason I include this in this book 
is because games often tell stories. Now, in the gaming world, this is a classic chestnut argument. How do games tell stories? When do they? The kind of consensus is that good games tell stories, and that stories make games stickier. They make you want to come back to them and play. And that's, that's important. How games tell stories? There are a lot of different ways this happens. And for some people, it's not a big deal. Uh, there used to be a classic dispute in game studies called ludology versus narratology. And ludologists would say the important thing about a game is not that it's a text, not that it's a story, but it's the gameplay. Mm -hmm. When you're playing Tetris, you're not really interested in who's dropping these bricks on you. Although in Thomas Pynchon's uh, Against the Day, there's a mad Zeppelin pilot who flies over cities and drops four-piece bricks called tetraliths. And no one knows why he does this, but that be as it may. Nevertheless, there's some kind of storytelling going on. It might not be a coherent story, it may only be pieces of stories, but then you look at the major successful commercial games, and so many of them include stories. You look at, say, Call of Duty, one of the best-selling games of all time, and it has elaborate narrative structure. Uh, Nicholas Baker, the novelist, was interviewed by The New Yorker, and The New Yorker asked him, what's the most novelistic game you've played? And he said, Mass Effect 2, which I would agree and endorse. Actually, in terms of deep characters, multiple emotional conversational relationships, yeah, it's novel quality. But for us, for digital storytelling, we have to think about ways that when we play a game, we co-create a story. And perhaps we ventriloquize a character. I mean, our, our character moves and speaks. Um, some of you may have played, say, uh, uh, Half-Life, where the main character never says anything. Uh, people speak to him and he participates, kind of like uh, Muhammad does off screen in, in movies about Islam. But you, you participate in a kind of passive way, verbally, but you act and you mm -hmm. make choices in a more constructive way. I, I mean, I don't mean that in a value judgment, in a more constructivist way. There are games where your actions actually drive narratives. Sort of a sandbox game like uh, uh, Fallout, uh, the Fallout series, or like uh, Grand Theft Auto, you actually determine the shape of plots as you go, the sequence of events and, and who you interact with. Virtual worlds can support this in some extent, like uh, Second Life, for example, mm -hmm. um, and the new Open Sim. Um, a really good example would be Minecraft, which is perhaps, I would say, the most successful virtual world right now. I mean, it leaves Second Life and Open Sim in the dust. Playing Minecraft is an act of storytelling. And if you, if you haven't played it, and if you're not sure if it's storytelling, you have no choice, because the act of playing it throws you into a story. That is, you enter this world, and you have no idea what's going on. You're interacting with objects. And the sun moves across the sky. It's thickly pixelated in a kind of cartoonish way. But it starts growing dark as you're walking around thinking, I can punch a tree. That's interesting. Why do I have pieces of wood? The sun goes down, and you hear sounds. And you wander around wondering how it's hard to see in the dark. A skeleton runs up to you, making a terrifying sound, and starts killing you. Whatever you think about games and technology, whatever you think about what makes stories happen, you're already in that storytelling moment, and you die. And you think, well, that was a bad story. I need to do this again. And then you restart it, and this game has hooked you. And you want to tell a better story, which doesn't end with you dying. And remember Choose Your Own Adventure books? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, there's always, you find the death pages, mm -hmm. right? And you bookmark them. You put your thumb in them. Okay, turn to page 66. No, 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 no. I know what happens there. All right, turn to page 55. You know, and you work your way through it. And Minecraft tells a story. It's not the same as sitting down and reading Hamlet. It's not, I'm, I'm reading right now David Mitchell's book, Ghost Written. And it's an extraordinary novel. And it's a very, very different experience to play a game. Much like a story on Twitter is a different experience. Much like watching The Wire on television is a different experience than reading a novel. I think for all of us in education, we have to be aware the storytelling universe around us has just changed. There's a kind of rebirth of storytelling in new formats. And by God, we should pay attention to it and maybe tell some stories. How are we doing for time? Okay. Thank you, Brian. That was, that was amazing. Well, I was going to ask you a question about economics and storytelling, but I think that would depress everybody. No, actually, but one, of, one of the amazing things, though, about, about the economic, well, I'm talking about economics because Professor Greenlaw invited me very kindly into his seminar with wonderful students and a terrific discussion about mathematical models and their, uh, what makes us invest so much in them and how much um, the predictive value. I mean, it's a fascinating deep discussion. But so much of economic discussion is about competing storytelling. We're trying to create narratives to explain what happened. And so... You must know Dave Colander. Not offhand. Uh, He's at Middlebury. 
I'm, I, I may be hitting my Dunbar yeah. number right now uh -huh. and, and not able to bring back all the names, sure. but, but one of the things that happens is you think, okay, what caused the crisis? Mm -hmm. and so the one story is it can be the banksters and, and the financial sector that has gone greedy and rapacious and useless, unproductive. And that's a clear narrative that mobilizes things. You can stretch it over time as characters, mm -hmm. like the movie Inside Job, for example. Yeah, sure. Or you flip it around and say, no, 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 it was the greedy uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. They did this stupid thing with Congress pushing too much housing and that draws on personal greed and incompetence. And suddenly you're talking about a kind of juicy story with flawed characters. And then you turn around another way. You know, I mean, you th think about the phrasing we use to talk about this stuff. There's a lot of gothic language. Mm -hmm. Zombie banks, the undead economy, ghost cities, um, or, or pitchforks, right? The constant fear of peasants with pitchforks. It's about storytelling. I mean, today, right now, we don't know if the federal government's going to operate on Monday. It might just shut down. Already we're competing, we're trying to generate competing stories to explain this. I mean, whether we think about stories as something for us to work on to create, we're swimming in them. Let's just do it more intelligently. That's what liberal education is about. Absolutely. Hopefully my book can help. Absolutely. I have to head to a, a flight, I'm afraid, and, and fly north to Vermont, where they have this season called winter, you know, which is still going on. Well, thank, thanks for uh, talking today, Brian. This was, this was really fun. Well, this is my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Jim. Hey, thank you, Brian. Gosh, speaking of Zach. Brian Alexander.